Good afternoon and welcome to the Caregiver Teleconnection. My name is Glenda Rogers and I'm going to be your facilitator for today's session with Dr. Aaron Blight. And he's going to be talking about caregiver stress, what it is and what to do about it. And that what to do about it is such an important part that we can take action to help. So let me introduce you to him before he gets started. Put my glasses on. Uh, Dr. Blight is an international speaker and consultant on caregiving, aging, and health care. He is the founder of Caregiving Kinetics. He works with providers that serve aging and disabled populations to deliver workforce consulting training for frontline caregivers, focus group research, and leadership advisory services. He conducts workshops and conferences, and he invites participants to think deeply about the meaning and significance of their individual caregiving experiences. He also has a book and it's entitled When Caregiving Calls, Guidance as You Care for a Parent, Spouse or Aging Relative. Important topic there. And in his spare time, he serves as an assistant professor of public health at Shenandoah University. Welcome, Aaron. Thank you, Glenda. It's, I'm delighted to be here with you. All right, you can start whenever you're ready. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm really delighted to be here with you with WellMed Charitable, Charitable Foundation today. And I've been looking forward to our time together. Our topic is caregiver stress. And I think it's such an important topic for caregivers. I myself uh, have served in the family caregiver role. And that had a significant impact on my life, on my family, and even on the trajectory of my career. It ultimately led me to do more things professionally in, in the field of caregiving. And, uh, and that's also what led me to write my book, When Caregiving Calls. Um, to start off our topic today, oh, you know what? I'm not uh, able to advance my slides. Oh, there we go. There okay. We are. Um, I want to share with you uh, the last uh, few words of a poem that I wrote after my first year of caregiving. My mother-in-law had been diagnosed with a brain tumor, and she moved into our home to recover from brain surgery. She was supposed to stay in our home for two weeks. She ended up staying in our home for two years. And she lived for five and a half years in a, a state of cognitive steady decline mm. uh, over that period of time. But <clears throat> so our lives were upended when my mother-in-law uh, got cancer and we were trying to be the sandwich generation. We were trying to raise our own young children and also take care of my mother-in-law at the same time, all under one roof. And this is uh, the, these are the last four lines of a poem that I wrote that year, wrapped in responsibility, cloaked by urgency, ephemeral supremacy trespasses on me. And what strikes me today as I look back and read these words that I wrote is the sense of almost entrapment that I felt during this time where, um, you know, I was trying to raise a family, trying to further my education, trying to serve in the community, trying to work full time. <clears throat> and there were many things that I could control, but the one thing that I could not control was my mother-in-law's cancer and her needs and the fact that we had to meet her needs. And uh, so whatever we were doing, if mom needed help, we would we would stop what we were doing and we would help her. And so this sense of of uh, ephemeral supremacy is just what is what is what is it today that needs to be done and can't get to maybe some of the other things in in your life that you wanted to accomplish and uh, that's how that's how I felt after one year of family caregiving um, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about the causes of stress because I I was feeling really stressed during that period of time in my life. And I hope that I will say some things. I hope that you'll hear some things that will be useful to you. But in addition to the things that you hear, I would ask you to really focus on the thoughts that enter your mind and the feelings that enter your heart, because those are coming to you for a reason. And they might be an indication of something that, that you could do to help to alleviate your stress and make, make your life a little bit better. 
As we get started, I want to just ask you to rate yourself for a moment on a scale of one to 10, with low being low being one, 10 being high, how would you rate your level of stress? How would you rate your level of stress? And you know, if you would like to uh, put that in the chat, just put a number in the chat, and maybe Glenda could could read those after we get get a few of those in. So Glenda, if you start getting some some numbers, just uh, just well, call out for me. There's a seven already. Hey, seven. <laughs> we're yeah. off and running. <laughs> oh my, my five, seven, five, seven, nine, six. Those are all pretty high. Five. Okay. Yeah. okay. Well, I, those that are at fives, I salute you. You're, you're, you, maybe you don't need this webinar. <laughs> <laughs> here's here's uh, the definition of stress, a state of mental tension and worry caused by problems in your life, work, et cetera. Something that causes strong feelings of worry or anxiety. Stress can also be physical force or pressure. And it strikes me that all of these things can apply to the feelings that family caregivers feel. Um, uh, caregiving for an older adult, caregiving for a person with disabilities, uh, when your loved one is facing such adversity and hardship, that creates a lot of uh, mental, emotional tension. And so it can be very difficult to, to navigate this. And in fact, a, a couple of years ago, I came across this quote. I, I was uh, reading a journal article and this really struck me. The author said, caregiving fits the formula for chronic stress so well that it is used as a model for studying the health effects of chronic stress. That's striking to me that family caregivers are uh, something, family caregivers experience chronic stress to a degree that they they can just be held up as, as models of individuals who are experiencing chronic stress. Um, so what I'm going to do today is talk about 10 points of stress that caregiving causes. And we're going to talk a little bit about how caregiving stress can lead to burnout. Then I'm going to introduce three things, three ideas, three things that you can do about your caregiver stress. And then I'm going to offer you, offer you 10 tips for self-care. So let's get to it. Stress point number one, you can't control your loved one's health condition. I think that Glenda said this before we got on, before everybody was coming on, right? This is true. I did. <laughs> you can't control your loved one's health condition, and that can be very stressful. Now, I will mention that this pre presentation originally, I gave it uh, for the first time during the era of COVID. And so I found this picture and I uh, incorporated it into the presentation. And as I was getting ready for today's webinar, I thought, well, maybe I should change the picture. But I decided not to, because we may be kind of out of the woods with COVID. Are, are we? Are we not? I don't really know. But by the same token, that picture symbolizes so much of what family caregivers experience when they're stressed. And so um, so I left it in there. Stress point number two, you cannot control what your loved one needs. So we know that your loved one's condition uh, drives the care related needs that should be provided to your loved one. And so while you can't control the condition, you also can't control what they require in terms of care. And so you, as the family caregiver, are called upon to deliver those needs associated with caregiving. And so that can be very stressful. Stress point number three mm -hmm. is that caregiving changes your relationship with your loved one. In my book, When Caregiving Calls, I introduce something from the research in applied gerontology called family caregiver identity theory. It comes out of the work of Dr. Rhonda Montgomery, Dr. Carl Kozlowski. Over the course of some 28 years, they studied family caregivers and they were able to uh, identify changes in the relationship that occur over the long trajectory of caregiving. 
basically what they found is that your role in the relationship changes pursuant to the health-related needs of your loved one. And so historically, you may have fulfilled a family role. Let's say it's the role of daughter, and you're caring for your mother. And the role of daughter is loaded with meaning, has a lot of implications in terms of how you see your mother and how you interact with your mother, how you think about your mother. But if your mother uh, has a health condition and, and she starts to have caregiving related requirements, and it becomes your responsibility to meet those needs, uh, in the role, your functions and your interactions start to change. The nature of your dialogue changes. The things that you think about your mother will change. And this can be very unnerving for family caregivers, and it can create a sense of, of conflict within themselves. Um, when I was caring for my mother-in-law, I experienced this. I did not know that this is, this is what was going on. But today I would say, you know, I just wanted to be a son-in-law. I didn't want to be a family caregiver, but nevertheless, that was thrust upon me. And so this is something that can be very stressful for family caregivers. Stress point number four is that caregiving can crowd out your other important responsibilities and activities in life. Um, you know, you're not uh, able to necessarily dedicate 100% of your time and attention to your loved one. And as their needs increase, uh, you may find yourself being summoned to provide more and more caregiving assistance. And that can easily be at the expense of other uh, activities that are important to you, including other relationships or work or hobbies. And um, so this can be very stressful for family caregivers. Stress point number five, uh, and this is especially true as the needs of the care receiver intensify. As your loved one requires more and more care, you are always on call to care. Family caregivers who have been uh, providing this level of assistance know that even when they're not with their loved one, uh, they may have to drop what they are doing on a moment's notice to go and offer help to their loved one. And when you're in this type of environment, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, it causes stress. Stress point number six, Financing and coordinating your loved one's care is very difficult. If you've been doing this for a while and trying to help your loved one navigate the healthcare delivery system with lots of different providers, the aging support services system with all of its different providers, um, paying for services, trying to understand Medicare or your health insurance requirements or your long-term care insurance requirements, trying to orchestrate and schedule the different uh, calendars that are required for, for, for the different providers that your loved one has. This is can be extremely complicated and extremely time-consuming and extremely expensive, all causing stress. Stress point seven. Many times, family caregivers feel like they're just not doing enough. And the paradox of that is that they're doing everything that they can do, and they still feel like it's not enough. And that causes a lot of uh, mental stress. Stress point number eight, caregiving forces you to make decisions that you really never, ever wanted to make. Um, one of the common decisions that I see is the decision about whether or not to um, transition your loved one into facility-based care. This can be a very distressing, difficult decision. And I will never ever judge a family caregiver for how they land on that decision. Um, Oftentimes, family caregivers made a promise long ago, oh, 
I'll never, I'll never put you into a facility. I promise you, no matter what, I'll take care of you forever. Not knowing what the future may hold. And when the needs of the care receiver exceed the capacity of one family caregiver to deliver them, something may have to be done. And that can be very hard, very hard to, to accept. But nevertheless, um, it's a decision that you may have to make. Stress point number nine is that caregiving inherently presents a roller coaster of emotions. Um, there is a lot of anguish, uh, guilt, uh, grief, pain, sadness, happiness, moments of joy. But a lot of times the adversity of your loved one and the implications of their health condition can produce um, some great emotional impact on you. Uh, there's a reason why family caregivers um, are models of chronic stress. There's a reason why family caregivers experience clinical depression at rates that are quadruple the average population. It's because of all of the emotional energy that's wrapped up in the family caregiving experience. Stress point number 10. This is the one that you almost don't want to talk about. As your loved one is nearing end of life, um, you are confronted with the hard reality of what will your life be like without them. The implications of your loved one passing away can be permanent and profound and very stressful and uncertain. And my heart goes out to all family caregivers that are struggling with this type of, uh, of dilemma. So I pause here for a second and I would just ask you as, mm. as I was reviewing those 10 stress points, which, which one, or, or maybe there's a couple that resonate most with you. And that is not intended to be an all-inclusive list those are just 10 stress points that I wanted to cover today. There might be some other things that really are acute stressors for you in the family caregiving experience. And I'd ask you to try to identify what are the stressors in your life. So caregiving stress leads to something called caregiver burnout. Burnout is exhaustion, of physical or emotional strength or motivation that usually comes as a result of prolonged stress or frustration. <laughs> I'm sorry, my voice is starting to, to go. I'm gonna pop a throat lozenge in here. So. You just got also... another class, so I'm sure you're I was, I was stressed. I, no, I'm not stressed. It's just my voice. I've been talking too much. I'm very sorry. <laughs> I said your voice was stressed. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yes. <the> voice is... <laughs> Burnout is also defined as causing to fail or wear out or to become, become exhausted, especially from overwork or overuse. And you can see how a family caregiver is on this. It's all I, sometimes I describe the family caregiver as a hamster on a wheel. Hmm. It's going and 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 going. Never ever being able to pause, take a break. And, and this exhaustion, physical exhaustion or the emotional exhaustion can easily re result. Well, what are some of the signs? of caregiving burnout. These signs can be emotional, they can be physical, they can be cognitive, they can also be behavioral. In terms of the emotional side of burnout, you might find yourself increasingly irritable or you might have these feelings of anger that are bottled up inside. Maybe you have a sense of hopelessness 
Physical signs of burnout include headaches, abdominal, abdominal or digestive issues, hypertension. From a cognitive standpoint, mentally, you may find that it's hard to concentrate. You may feel a, a lower sense of self-esteem or an increased sense of self-blame and guilt. Behaviorally, uh, some of the signs of burnout could be substance abuse. That's not uncommon for people who are stressed uh, and who are burned out. Chronic lateness. Um, you may withdraw from your regular activities, from friends, from other relationships. That sense of withdrawal is also a behavioral manifestation of burnout. You may be feeling a lack of joy in your life. All of these things can be symptoms of caregiving burnout. So I just at pause here and, and ask you if you're experiencing any of these symptoms or signs of burnout, emotionally, physically, cognitively, behaviorally. And if so, um, I would ask you to, to consider that and think about some ways, some things that you can do to help yourself be a little, a little better, a little happier. Now there's been some some research in the field, and there was a researcher named Zaret. He came up with an instrument um, with a, to assess caregiver burden, and you can access uh, that instrument from my website. If you go to caregivingkinetics.com and you go to the downloadable resources for caregivers page, and you scroll down to the bottom of that page. There will be a link that will take you to the Zaret Caregiver Burden Assessment Tool. And that actually takes you to an external website that looks like this. It's on agingcare.com. But you can download this, um, this survey and ask yourself these questions and then score, score yourself and see where, where are you on the caregiver burden scale. If you are experiencing frequent signs of caregiver burden, then I would really urge you to do something about that. So what can you do about caregiver stress? I wanna talk about three things today. One is to assess your stressors. The second one is to assess how you spend your time. And the third one is intentional self-care. I'm going to ask you a question related to each of these three areas. What are your caregiving stressors? Now, we went through 10 stress points. Maybe there's something in that list that was a stressor for you, uh, but maybe there's something else that is particularly stressful for you. But it's important for you to identify what are the stressors that are making you um, making it, making things challenge for you challenging for you. This is a little exercise that I like to invite family caregivers to do. And I want to just tell you a little story about a family caregiver who I met. Um, and she was would describe herself as a clean freak. Everybody knows that she would keep her house spotless but she was one of five children and her mother needed caregiving assistance. And so her mother asked her of all the five children, her mother asked her to come up and clean the house once a week. So this family caregiver dutifully decided that, okay, mom, I'll come up and I'll clean your house once a week. Despite the fact that there were four other siblings that could have done it, she did it once a week. Every time that she would go up and clean her mother's house, she lost a full day of her week because she had to drive up. It was a three-hour drive. She spent the day cleaning. Then she spent three hours driving home one day every week for a few years to clean her mother's house. And over time, she resented doing this, but she kept doing it because she felt like she had to. After her mother passed away, she confidentially told me that she knew that she really didn't have to do this. 
and she wishes that she hadn't. She wishes that she would have reduced that pressure in her life by simply saying, mom, I can't clean your house every week. I can come every two weeks. <clears throat> we can have my sister do it. There are other solutions we can hire out. So this was something that she could have controlled in her caregiving situation that she didn't. Now, the same family caregiver recognized that there was another stressor that she could not control with her mother, and that was her mother's hospitalizations. Housekeeping is very different than hospitalization. And so when her mother unexpectedly uh, had to go to the hospital, she would go up and she would be there for her mother. And there's a big difference here, and my point is you can control something like housekeeping. You can't control something like hospitalizations. And so if you were to make a list of the things that are causing you stress in your caregiving situation and just divide them up, stressors that you can control and stressors that you cannot control. And after you've done this, look at the list of stressors that you can control and ask yourself, how can I address this a little bit better to reduce the stress in my life? It's a simple exercise, but if you do it honestly, it will help you to reduce your stress. The second question is, how are you spending your time? And there's sort of an overarching principle that goes with this. When you can't do everything, do the things that matter the most. Time is a limited resource. And as we talked about earlier, caregiving can encroach upon your time. So it's really important for you to evaluate how you're spending your time so that you can allocate your time in the most effective way. This is another exercise of, of lists. I would invite you to look at how you're spending your time, the different activities that you're doing and spending your time, and put them in, put each item, each uh, time spender in one of three columns. Things that are the most important, things that are moderately important, and things that are least important. And just try to think through your, your week and how, how you're routinely spending your time and just assign each one of those things to one of these columns, most important, moderately important, and least important. Now, you know what's coming next, right? <laughs> After you've done this exercise, look down at the least important list and ask yourself, well, if those are the least important things, do you really need to do them? Could you have someone else do them? Can you decide not to do them at all? What would be the consequence? And if you give yourself permission to let go of those least important items, your stress level will be reduced. And when caregiving calls, um, I talk about some different time management strategies for caregivers. These include allocation of time, saying, okay, I'm going to set aside specifically time for caregiving activities. Timing. Timing might be when in your daily schedule or your weekly schedule are you going to have caregiving. Um, rather than leaving that up to your care receiver or leaving that up to doctor's offices, you might schedule uh, doctor's appointments at times that are convenient for you. Duration. This is another important one. If you're going to visit uh, your Aunt Sally as a sort of caregiving companionship visit, and Aunt Sally is extremely talkative, and you know that you could be stuck there for three and a half hours and you only have an hour, then commit to yourself. I'm going to visit Aunt Sally for one hour, and I am not going to allow myself to be sucked into a three-hour visit. Frequency. This gets back to the housekeeping example that I gave earlier. How frequently do you need to do caregiving tasks? And can you adjust the frequency of some of these tasks in order to reduce your stress? 
sequence. Consider the order of the things that you're doing. This could also have an effect of stress reduction. The last one is taking time. It's important for you to take time for yourself amidst the day-to-day -day stress of caregiving. I wanna talk for a minute about taking time because this strategy is super important. I would encourage you to take time to do things that will lift your soul and will add fuel to your tank. It's so important to be able to step away from, as Elizabeth Kubler-Ross says, from the sick room, mm. from the intense needs of your care receiver so that you can be rejuvenated and you can be refreshed and you can feel better and happier about yourself and your life. And this goes to uh, the question of self-care. And my third question is, what are you doing to take time to take care of yourself? Now, I feel like the word self-care has become almost trite. Uh, I, I don't like the way that it's thrown around all the time as this simplistic solution. But the fact is, you will be more effective caring for, your, for others if you first take care of yourself. And this word self-care, I, I started to see it being kind of misused so frequently that I decided to write a blog post about it. Huh. Uh, there's the link to, to my blog post about what self-care is not. That's the title of the, of the blog post. But self-care is not self-indulgence. It's not pampering. It's not selfishness. And it's not entitled. Self-care is compassionate, balanced, humble, and thoughtful. Self-care, true self-care recognizes the context in which you need to take care of yourself. You're not ignoring the needs of others. You're saying, you know, that same kind of grace and compassion that I've extended to other people, I have to, out of necessity for my own wellness, extend that to myself. And I'm not going to ignore my responsibilities but I'm going to recognize that for me to be well, I have to take care of myself. And so the question is, well, how do you do that? How do you take care of yourself? And your self-care approach should be unique to you. I'm not going to sit here and tell you how you should practice self-care. I do not believe in a one-size-fits-all approach to self-care. But I do know that there are a number of things that have been proven to contribute to self-care. And so I'd like to suggest uh, 10 self-care tips for you today. The first self-care tip is to seek help from a counselor or a mental health therapist. Now, some people are very reluctant to do this. Some people maybe have never seen a counselor or a mental health therapist, and that's okay. Uh, the fact is, caregiving pr puts you into a situation that causes a lot of stress, a lot of mental and relationship change, a lot of transition, a lot of adversity and challenge and trial and worry and anxiety. And if ever there was a time that you might need to see a counselor, this could be the time. And so I, if you're experiencing a lot of negative emotions associated with your caregiving experience, I would encourage you to reach out and get some professional help. On that downloadable resources for caregivers page on caregivingkinetics.com, there's also a little exercise called an emotions worksheet that can help you to assess how you are doing emotionally with respect to your caregiving experience. And that may help you to realize, is it time to see help, seek help from a counselor? Self-care tip number two is diet and exercise. We hear this all the time, but we need to take care of our bodies. When our bodies are physically better, we are also mentally and emotionally better. I am amazed at how my diet affects me. I'm just gonna be, confess right now, if it's, bu if it's buttery, sugary, salty, I like it. Okay. <laughs> But the fact is, that stuff isn't as good for you. So when I eat more, less of that stuff, 
and more of the fruits and vegetables and things like that that we know are healthier, I feel better. I feel better. When I exercise, I feel better than when I don't. So, and these things have been demonstrated in the research over and over again. Diet and exercise are keys to self-care. Self-care tip number three is respite care. You may need to give yourself permission to entrust the care of your loved one to someone else for a brief period of time so that you can get out and do something that you need to do or that you want to do. That's what respite care is. And sometimes just getting away for a few hours can make a huge difference in redu reducing your level of stress. Self-care tip number four is to see your physician. Now this kind of goes along with some of the things that we talked about earlier, but physically you want to be in your best condition so that you can be as well as possible for yourself or others who depend on you. And disregarding um, your uh, annual checkups or not going in for that health condition that you yourself know is lingering, that can be detrimental to your well-being. So I would encourage you to take time to see your to see your doctor. Self-care tip number five, join a caregiver support group. I am a huge, huge, huge advocate for caregiver support groups. If you join a caregiver support group, you can find other people who are experiencing similar challenges. This is a group that can understand what you're going through. They can provide resources for you. They can be moral support, a shoulder to cry on. They can commiserate with you. They can laugh with you on some of the things that despite yourself, you have to laugh about. And as a tribute to caregiver support groups, one of the most amazing things that happens is long after the caregiving season of your life is over, uh, friends, friendships who are friendships that are established through caregiver support groups continue. People remain friends. People remain connected to caregiver support groups even after their caregiving season is over. And I just think that is a testament to the bonds that are established through caregiver support groups. There are a lot of these around. They're online. They're in your local community. They can be organized based on disease condition. They can be organized based on who the caregiver is. They even employers nowadays are starting, large employers are starting to offer these internally to their employees. I think that's wonderful. Self-care tip number six is setting realistic expectations about what you can and cannot do. Um, it's okay to have limits on what you can do. You don't want to sacrifice all of your time or sacrifice your well-being or cross boundaries that should be established in providing care for your loved one. So you need to give yourself permission to have realistic expectations of what, what can one person do in this situation. And that can help you reduce your stress. Self-care tip number seven is to go outside. The research shows that when we're outside in the, in the sunlight, we get the vitamin D, it's uplifting. It's uh, a way to just take in nature to turn off your devices, to get out from the air conditioning <laughs> and uh, just experience the beauty of nature. This is something that can lift your spirit and help you to feel better. Self-care tip number eight, spend time doing something you enjoy. Is there something that you used to do that you gave up because of caregiving? Mm -hmm maybe a hobby, something that just intrinsically brought you satisfaction. Maybe it's playing a musical instrument. Maybe it's arts and crafts. Maybe it's woodworking in the garage. 
Maybe it's feeding the birds. I don't know what it is, but what's that one thing that popped into your mind when I asked about this, this, this self-care tip? And whatever that one thing is, I would encourage you to pick that back up. Take time to say, you know what? I'm going to do this for me. And that will help you. Self-care tip number nine is to write regularly in a gratitude journal. Not just any journal, a gratitude journal. You know, if you look for the good, you'll find the good. And many family caregivers report finding a lot of good despite the adversity of their lives. And taking time to step back and count your blessings, to be grateful for what you do have, can really be good for your soul, which leads me to self-care tip number 10, which is nourishing, nourishing your soul. Take time for your spiritual self. Whatever faith tradition you're in, uh, I would encourage you to engage in those spiritual activities that will lift you and help you to do better spiritually. When we're better spiritually, we're also better physically, mentally, and emotionally. So as we've gone through those self-care tips, uh, I would ask you, you know, what did your mind and heart tell you that you could do in terms of self-care? Maybe it was one of those 10 tips Maybe there was something that was completely unrelated to those 10 tips that popped into your mind and heart. But whatever that thing was that came to your mind about how you could practice a little better self-care, I would encourage you to write that down and to do it. I would be remiss if I went through this presentation and did, it, did not acknowledge the impact that you are having in the lives of the people around you. Thank you for what you're doing. The world is a better place for you because of you. I often say that family caregivers are the secret of our long-term care delivery system in America. Without you, where would your loved one be? I, I do not know. I also want to thank WellMed Charitable Foundation for having me here today. And um, here is how you can reach me if you want to email or subscribe to the blog. There's where you can do that. And I think we have a little time for questions. Mm, good, good. Oh, thank you so much for that information. I, I, the flow of your presentation is better than any I've ever seen on this topic. So thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Okay. Would you like to join in the conversation? Um, you can unmute your microphone, raise your hand if you're on Zoom, or if you're on your telephone, just press star six and that will unmute your telephone and I will call on you by your area code. If it causes you stress <laughs> to join us in the conversation, don't do it. <laughs> it's not mandatory. Donna, I see that your phone is unmuted. Go ahead. Hi, so um, I'm new to caregiving. I'm into this just a few months. <clears throat> And I just wanted to share, it was kind of funny that I actually was so stressed this morning that I thought about not attending the Zoom meeting. And I thought that was pretty dumb. <laughs> so, I, and I really appreciate um, the presentation and your work. And uh, it, it really did help me a bit. I've got a, kind of some things now that I need to work on. So wow. thank you. Thank you, Donna, and I'm I'm so glad you chose chose to to join us. That's that uh, taking time for yourself once in a while. And, exactly. And good yep. for you. You're yep. you're on the right. You're you're off to a good start. It sounds like. Thanks. Yeah. Come back, Donna. We we want well, to see you back. future presentations. <laughs> <laughs> I'll see you soon, Linda. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Michelle. You Thanks. had a question. Yes. Uh, Thank you so much, Erin. This was a very helpful uh, topic. And uh, I've been in this for about a year now. And uh, it's a fast moving stage of Alzheimer's that my oh. husband was diagnosed with. So it's been, he's been, at, was at home until January and then skilled nursing. Then um, he's now in a nursing home memory care. 
And you talk about doing things that matter. <laughs> I have this question, if he doesn't remember it and it causes me stress to do it, mm -hmm. should I do it? Mm -hmm. Well, Michelle, that's a, that's a very poignant question. I think that's a question that only you can answer. You know the answer to that question, I think, but it doesn't make the answer any easier to to reach. Mm -hmm. And um, sometimes when people are caring for uh, a person with Alzheimer's and they know that uh, their loved one has no memory of the encounter, um, they still go because they have memory of the encounter or because they feel like they they owe it to their loved one they their the love that they have for their loved one the experience that happens in the moment there's a question about how much does it really sink in we don't always know but you uh, michelle have brought up another another important point which is the impact that these visits are having on you emotionally and they can be absolutely heartbreaking. And to I think that my heart goes out to anyone who is caring for a loved one with dementia. Um, I think that it is an insidious disease. Um, I have no, <laughs> I don't I try to be very honest about that. Uh, I can't imagine conditions that are harder to deal with than to know that uh, your loved one is losing their sense of self, losing their memory of who you are, and that can be just soul crushing. And so do you protect yourself and decide not to go, or do you face, face that and still go? And I think only you can answer that question, Michelle. Mm -hmm. But the other thing that I would say, and I mentioned this before, is that I would never judge you for what you did or did not do in that circumstance. Um, I, I don't think that any of us should be judging the decisions that a family caregiver makes because these decisions are by their very nature extremely hard and you love your family member and you want what's best for them. And there's no easy answer. There's no winning solution here. You're just trying to make the best of it. Thank you. There's Thank that you, big Michelle. word. There's that big word, guilt. Uh, uh. Yes, indeed. Um. Thank you, Michelle. Again, please. I've I've seen you before. I know the session. Just keep coming back. If you can see right there, the session survey just popped up. If you'll just take the second as we continue on, and uh, just complete that. Um, over in the chat box, I've been having a conversation. Um, when we ask about stress levels there, and one of our participants, uh, Barbara, said she was a 10. And so that was alarming, of course. And I asked her if she would be comfortable telling a little more about that. And uh, she shared with me that her loved one has frontal temporal dementia and then eating something that wasn't edible. Well, yeah, I can imagine that your stress level would uh, go up to about a 10. And she says they're monitoring him. So thank goodness for that. Um, yeah. Let's see what else was here. Um, Elizabeth tells us that her stress level when we started was at a nine and it's about half that much now. So she thinks she's <laughs> information. Isn't that yeah. wonderful? Just your voice, wow. I think, Aaron. <laughs> just level and half just with this. That's amazing. <laughs> I've never had that kind of instant feedback like that. <laughs> that was a good that. one. I had to share that one for sure. Yeah, uh, yeah that that's that's amazing. Uh, anybody else have a question, a comment, a situation that maybe you need a couple of more tips or information of how to handle? So, Glenda, can I can I make one comment? You can oh, sure. mention the word guilt. Yes. And in caregiving, I talk about the two G words. They are guilt and grief, guilt and grief. Uh. But um, 
a lot of, it's very common for family caregivers to feel guilt. And the way that I try to uh, envision that or describe that is guilt is the result of, of when you have set this kind of idealized standard for yourself. And so you, you say, oh, this up here, this is how I should be, this idealized version of, of who you are in this relationship. And then when you look, your, look at yourself in the mirror, you have the standard that's up here, but then you see yourself down here. And so you have this huge gap between who you think you should be and who you actually are. And that just engenders these feelings of guilt because it's and, and the guilt can be so complex. It's guilt for what you did do, guilt for what you didn't do. I mean, it it runs the gamut. And I would simply encourage you, if you're a person who is feeling guilt a lot, I would encourage you to, to, to extend to yourself some compassion. And that same kind of grace that you are extending to your loved one, please extend that to yourself and recognize that that you're doing the best that you can, and that's that's all you can do, and mm -hmm. let go of that idealized version of who you think you should be, because your loved one is blessed to have you in their life. Nobody is caring for them in the same way that you are, and it's okay that things aren't perfect because this is a, a very much a difficult, imperfect situation. And um, just that kind of self-compassion is something that I think we owe, owe to ourselves, especially family caregivers owe to themselves. Mm. Yeah, many of the things you said really struck home about, they are the backbone of our industry when it comes to caring for people. And the other thing that popped into my brain was you you spoke about um, making a promise to someone that you would never put them in a long-term care facility and how guilt-ridden you can be over that. That's been one of my <laughs> passions over the many years I've been doing this is, you know, you can phrase that when you're talking to someone about that by saying, I will do everything humanly possible, but I can't guarantee you that I could never do that, which then gives you the release from that guilt that you might feel later yeah. when you have to play somebody. That's, I think that's a great way to phrase it, Glenda. Yeah. I've seen many people just guilt ridden over that. Yeah. Okay. We have about five minutes. If anybody have a question or a comment that you'd like to make, uh, you've been on with me before. I don't keep you just because the clock doesn't say that it's <laughs> the hour is up, but um, we'd love to hear from you if you have a question or a comment. Well, as Minerva said, the October calendar will be out shortly, maybe even today. Um, if not, a little bit, maybe the first of the week. Um, we hope that you'll take a look at that on the website, or if you're on a mailing list, you'll get it automatically uh, to see what's coming up in October. Um, I don't have it before me, so I can't tell you quite yet, but let me look here and see what I have on the rest of September. Uh, Monday, September the 30th. If you know someone that is primarily Spanish speaking, we are going to have a Spanish uh, language session at 10 o'clock Central Time on Monday talking about the basics of Medicare. And so if you know somebody that could benefit from that, please um, tell them about the Caregiver Teleconnection and how, you know, since you've done it, tell them how they can connect with us. We'd love to, to have them join us on that Spanish language session. Well, Erin, it's been my pleasure to meet you and uh, to be with you on this session. I hope you'll come back and join us again sometime. I'd be glad. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, good. Thank you, Michelle. And all of you out there, thank you for joining us today. We know your schedules are just unimaginable with caregiving responsibilities, and you took time out for yourself. And so that, I hope, is self-care for you. I hope to see you on future sessions, and thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.